with the smaller, um, the smaller numbers. So page 227, you can follow along. I'll also be a little bit to follow along with on the screen. And invite the family to come forward.
So these are just uh, made by our quilters here at Glory Day to remind um, both of our uh, beloved children of God that they are wrapped not only in the love of God, but in the love of their church family. Join together in praying the prayer of the day. Let us pray. O Lord God, teach us that without love our actions say nothing. Pour into our hearts your most excellent gift of love, that made alive by your Spirit, we may know goodness and peace. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God. The first lesson is from the 11th chapter of Acts. Peter's vision, God give the Gentiles repentance that leads to life. Acts 11, 1 through 18. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized Peter saying, why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time the voice answered from heaven, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. This is the word of the Lord. The second lesson is from the 21st chapter of Revelation. New heaven, new earth, springs of living water in the new Jerusalem. Revelation 21, one through six. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, 
the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bridegroom, bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. This is the word of the Lord. According to John, the 13th chapter. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. And I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the gospel of the Lord. You be seated. <clears throat> when I was on sabbatical, I indulged in the luxury of not watching the news. And I have to admit that um, that was a point of privilege and indeed a luxury. Um, I could step away from that, and my life wasn't going to be changed that much. But we know that in the news, there are real people being affected every day by the happenings in the world. And so this commandment that Jesus gives us to love one another, but when we take it seriously, it's heartbreaking. Because loving the world that God loves, that Christ died for, is heartbreaking. And so I checked out for that short time. I took a step back from the heartbreak and the grief. The cold hard truth that we know is that loving is a risk. It's a big risk. And that big risk of love is heartbreak and grief. And haven't we all had just about enough of that? We take one look at the world around us, not to mention to take inventory of the personal losses we've endured, and being wrapped in a little bubble, that sounds pretty inviting. But here's another cold, hard truth. Wrapping ourselves in that little bubble doesn't change what's happening in the world. We all keep waking up in a world where there is violence and death and war and disease and disaster and division and hate and greed. But here is also what I know. What we have heard today in the scripture is that the only way through it is love. Jesus said it is what marks us as his followers, his disciples. People will know us by our love for one another. It can sound trite, 
I admit that. In the face of so much heartbreak and grief, all you need is love doesn't seem like a practical solution. Sounds like an impossible dream, silly even, an easy out. But since we're dealing in cold, hard truths, rolling our eyes at Jesus' command to love one another, that's the actual easy out. Scoffing at the power that the love that Christ loved us with, that's what's silly and impractical. Because this isn't hearts and flowers and wishful thinking. No, this is the kind of love that makes us roll up our sleeves and get our hands dirty. This is love that breaks our heart in this broken world. But it's also tenacious and it's gritty love. It's also the only thing that can heal us and heal the world that breaks our hearts. And we need only look at the cross. The dying Christ forgives his executioners. He's crying out in heartache, in despair, in pain. He's feeling forsaken, betrayed, and alone. He is grieving the sin of this world that God loves and is still willing to die for it. So what does that love say? Is that soft? Is that easy? No. It's risky, it's tenacious, it's vulnerable, and then in that vulnerability lies the power of it. When the love of Christ holds the power in our lives, what else can claim us? Can anything else really take hold for long? Oh, sure, we will be hurt. We will be heartbroken. We will grieve. That's the cost of love. But what about the joy of love? The joy of new life. Those two things are inseparable. Trying to experience the risk of love and the joy of love, one without the other, it shortchanges everything. The story from Acts, the story that Peter is retelling in what we heard Jay read today, it actually took place in the entirety of of chapter 10 before it. It's a story that takes up a lot of real estate, so maybe we should give our attention to it. But the disciples have living in a world that's turned upside down, and they've been running a marathon in an effort to keep up with all the Holy Spirit is doing. Peter's right there in the thick of it. I reread all of chapter 10, and I recommend when you guys get a chance this week, you go home uh, maybe this afternoon, maybe tonight, tomorrow morning, and take a look at it for yourself. But I was struck with the consistency with which Peter tells and retells the story of what took place. It said there in the scripture, he told it carefully, one thing at a time. And I'm also impacted then by that the story Peter continues to tell about Jesus. And when you read the book of Acts, you don't just hear it once, you hear it again and again. And then you hear over and over again that the result of that story is people being baptized. The Holy Spirit works through that story and changes the way those who hear it look at the world forever. It's a story of the love that moves others to love. It's a story of forgiveness that moves others to forgive. And then today we hear Peter come to the conclusion, the conclusion that he makes after going through all this his vision, and then the vision to Cornelius, and then they came to get him, and then he went there, and then they all told the whole story again. And how he realized that who was he? Who was he to hinder God? (laughs) Who was he to hinder God? As if he could. 
right? But that is sort of the point of his statement. How could he hinder God after having experienced firsthand the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the love of Christ? And why would he even try to keep that from reaching out to anyone else? Even before time began, God's love was so big. So big that God created a world to share that love with. Love brought about this entire creation. We came from love. We're sustained by love. We die without it. We also die if we do not share it. The love Jesus commands us with is a command for life. And this is the story of life that Peter told again and again, the story of the crucified and risen Christ. Peter saw what had happened, and he told it to everyone, whether they were Jew or Gentile, no matter what they ate, no matter if they circumcised their sons. God in Christ died and rose in the hope of bringing the whole world into a new, right relationship with God. God loves and gives us. God's love is what gives us our identity. God's love is what defines us as God's children. So the moment that one certain thing we do, eating certain things, the the, uh, different ways we think we need to be church, all of those things, the more they become more important than the God that we do it for, then that's the moment that we've decided that our own works can save us, and then that's when we're lost for sure. When I was in seminary, my dear and wise advisor, I didn't know then how wise she was. I didn't want to listen. But Reverend Reverend Connie Kleingartner preached a sermon to remind her students that over the years, the ministry in our roles would change. Even as we stayed in one church or especially as we moved from one church to another. We couldn't look for our identities in the ministry that we were called to do year to year. Because if we did that, we would risk an identity crisis every time things changed or every time we went to a new church. But that's just not true of pastors or other leaders in the church. It's true of all disciples, and it's true in each stage of life. We transition from one thing to another, from employed to unemployed or to retired, from single to married to perhaps divorced or to lose a spouse, from a young parent to an empty nester maybe even from a driver to someone who can't see well enough to drive anymore. And then don't forget all those daily, those sometimes hourly transitions we experience as we move endlessly back and forth between sinner and saint. Broken sinner, blessed saint, (coughs) fallen saint, forgiven sinner. All these transitions, they can be challenging, but one thing is sure through them all, that we never lose the identity that is most central. We never lose what grounds us or what holds us at our core, because we are forever children of God, members of the body of Christ. We're held fast by love in the faith that we have been given by the Holy Spirit, and we're united in our need for God's grace. We are all washed in the water, we're fed with the bread and the wine, but it isn't so much that we do these things that identify us. What identifies us, what defines us, is the power of God's love that gathers us together to do all those things, like baptism and communion and prayer and worship and serving others, all those things that matter. Well, that was the same for the early church. Their identity came from loving 
as Christ first loved them. And as it was in the early church, it is here now among us. That love given to us by God's abundant grace through the power of God's Holy Spirit is the identity we share. The love of Christ is what saves. Not the things we do. It's never about what we do. Because we'll always fall short somewhere. But it's God who works through us. The love of God that accomplishes what we cannot It's God in the crucified and risen Christ whose love reveals to us who we are and whose we are. We're forgiven, we're beloved, and then we're sent out to share the blessings of this life of love. That doesn't leave us off the hook. It's not cheap love that we can claim to have but then not live out. But God sends us out with the opportunity to love over and over again. By God's grace, we get it right. We are sent to love a world that will break our heart, that will cause us grief. The love we give, the risk we take, is also the only thing that we know can heal us and heal the world. But that's it. That's the promise that God keeps That's the promise that God is faithful to. Our identity is that we are loved and we are sent to love others. The children of God, siblings in Christ, we are bound by a grace and a love that is bigger and stronger than ourselves. And just like resurrection, that we don't have to explain or understand in order to receive, so is the mystery of God's love in Christ washes over us, it feeds us, it saves us, it is our identity, and it is our calling. And whatever vision God gives us to follow, whatever form it takes, the mission will always be to love others as Christ loved us. Amen. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, 
place holy love at the center of all our relationships and community. And by your love, heal us, convict us, and renew us. Bring an end to all the isms that divide our churches and our communities. Let everyone know your goodness by the love that we show one another. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Give us a place in the diverse company of your beloved saints. Teach us the value of each person's identity. Bless us with a shared identity as your children, as kindred of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. In your mercy, O oh God, respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior.